Come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits? The Saturday Night Freak Show. (laughs) Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast on the road edition. Or the experimental edition. This is we the are techno- not on the road. <laughs> well, <laughs> people will yell at us. We used to all be in the same dank, dark basement, and now we're spread across the globe from locations unknown. I'm uh, in Russia. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, if this is your first rodeo, we're a movie review podcast that, uh, and we don't normally sound like this. That's right. <laughs> this is uh, technology coming to our defense. As we are all in quarantine, as you are, um, for you time travelers. Yeah, this is going to be really weird when you look up and see what happened <laughs> in 2020. Um, so uh, we watch a movie that's chosen round robin by one of the internet radio superstars. And here they are. Michaela. Sean. <laughs> Holly. <laughs> and I'm Colin. At least I remembered well, that this week. At least Colin remembered this week. Yeah. Uh, a, uh, the Mexican standoff between me and Holly there for a second. Well, hey, do us a favor as we try to work through these. Uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're going to get back up to speed because I imagine that we're going to be like, you know, doing this four months to come. So eventually we'll have it down. Yeah. Pat. Uh, but if you like what you hear here, please go to wherever you found us and give us a like, a star rating or a review, uh, because all that stuff helps us get found by other like minded folks like you. Uh, this week we watched a movie that was chosen by Holly. Uh, Holly, what did we watch this week? Uh, this week we watched a movie called Bad Taste. From the year? 1987. 87, directed by? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to read it to you like this because this is my favorite. Directed, written, produced, photographed, <laughs> co-edited, and co-starring Peter Jackson. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a hyphenate, multi-hyphenate right there. It yeah. really is. <laughs> Peter Jackson is a filmmaker that uh, we are familiar with on this show. In fact, this particular movie puts Peter Jackson on the illustrious Saturday sure. Night Freak <gasps> Show Wall of Fame. That's right. The wall. Which Congratulations, is- sir. It's about time. I know. We should send medals to these people or something. Probably their little plaque. But as they get their little cutout eight by ten plastered on the wall, uh, which is maintained by MF Mad, the keeper of the wall. Uh, we have covered Peter Jackson in two other films. Can you folks identify them? Dead Alive. Yeah. I don't want to say Heavenly Creatures. Negative. No, the Frighteners. You are correct. Yeah. <clears throat> so there you go. Didn't didn't we uh, didn't we establish during that Frighteners podcast that we didn't think Peter Jackson was a good filmmaker? <laughs> Wasn't that the conclusion at the end of that? one? I mean, after watching that movie, I can understand why you would think that. <laughs> I thought about it. And we went through everything. We're just like, he doesn't make good movies. The math doesn't work out. Well, you're saying, yeah. but is there, okay, well, do you see a, um, to me, there's like a pre Frighteners, Peter Jackson and a post Frighteners, Peter Jackson. Yes. Um, some of the traits that, that we were complaining about his, um, a directorial, well, it's not even his style. It's, uh, it's more on the screenwriting end of it. It's his, basically he um, paints these big canvases. He stuffs overstuffs it with uh, plot, contr- you know, plotting and characters, and it makes these movies top heavy, right? Mm-hmm. Which I, did you Absolutely. have? Did you have that problem with Lord of his Lord of the Rings trilogy though? No, with the Hobbit, yes. And King Kong, yeah. which you can also get in an extended edition that's even longer than the. Uh, Whatever three hour version that was in. I tried. Movie. I tried <laughs> watching that movie one night, and boy, woof. King Kong is an exhausting movie. Yeah, that's yeah. a good way to describe it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to like in those pictures. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I do actually. It's strange. I I like the extended versions of the Lord of the Rings. Mm. Me too. I like them better than the standard, actually. Yeah. But I don't understand, you know, it's like, why do I, because, you know, basically the Lord and the Rings and the Hobbit are kind of uh, structured similarly where there's uh, these kind of uh, little vignettes of people getting into situations and then they get into another situation and then that climaxes and then they get into another situation. 
And the first Lord of the Rings movie feels more that way than the the other two. But all the Hobbit movies feel that way. Because well, the difference is The Hobbit is a 300-page book that was made into three movies. Mm-hmm. Right. Lord of the Rings is three books that are like probably all together like 1500 pages. So it just feels there was like no reason for The somewhere. Hobbit to be three movies. Well, and The Lord of the Rings has like multiple characters all following different storylines. True. Uh, King Kong and the Hobbit and the Frighteners has a whole lot of characters on the same storyline, it feels like, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And so they just feel like they're bloated and it's like at some point, probably, like I said, in the screenwriting uh, portion of the development, it's like you need to get in there and start, you know, cutting some of these subplots down. <laughs> All right. But before... Uh, uh, the Frighteners. He uh, was known as basically a uh, for doing splatter comedies, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely. These were really low yeah, budget but- things that he did out of uh, New Zealand, where he's from. Um, right. He started off with uh, so bad. Bad taste is his first movie. It is. Yeah, it was eighty seven, and then Meet the Feebles eighty nine, Dead Alive was ninety two. And do people know what Meet the Feebles is? The people, people who do that, have never been able to forget it. Yeah, the people that know these movies, I think, know what it is. Yeah, it's a it's a movie which basically re envisions the behind the scenes antics of uh, like the Muppet Show. I mean, they're not on brand Muppets. Although I hear that the Jim Han- I think uh, it was Jim Henson's daughter or something actually saw it and did like the movie because I think there was some uh, concern maybe that there'd be a lawsuit. But uh, it's like a kind of a gross behind the scenes look at really vulgar puppets it's the original happy time murders basically yeah with a little greg the bunny yeah uh we have so many of them now that's amazing (laughs) um so um yeah well i mean i guess this is the thing i guess uh splatter comedy like where in the hell did this come from what do you like i mean what do you think of when you hear the term like well i mean it was a splat stick Right, it's plant stick. <laughs> you never Boy. Evil Dead too. Yeah, think, probably. I think probably right. I mean, I know that like splatter yeah. movies are a thing that you know go back to like Herschel Gordon Lewis or whatever in the in the sixties. But the idea of mashing up, uh, you know, comedy and splatter, uh, to me feels like it's an Evil Dead two thing. Although I think the Japanese were doing stuff like that uh, maybe in the nineties. Um, Tokyo Gore Police and. Machine Girl, stuff like that. They were Everybody's really... got such better titles than us. Tokyo Gore Police. <laughs> <laughs> you heard about the new movie? Uh, I haven't looked it up yet. It's from the director of The Void. It's called PG. Psycho Gore Man. Psycho Gore Man. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's a good title. I gotta check yep. that out. Um, so yeah, so Bad Taste. Uh, this is 1987. Um, what can you tell us about this movie, Holly? Um, well, it was originally a short, um, it was about 10 minutes and it was actually, it was actually uh, made over the course of like four years. Um, they were filming it on the weekends, basically. Um, obviously they all, they all had their own like full-time jobs. This was just kind of like a side thing that Peter Jackson was doing. Um, he was investing $25,000 of his own money, um, and it wasn't until several years into it that it was funded by the New, New Zealand Film Commission. And they, he got, um, I think it was like 240000 to put towards it, something like that. Um, so it was, it was obviously a really small project at first, and it grew over the course of four years. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's basically and, uh, like, a, it's like a, well, I mean, like a student film or something. Yeah, basically. I, I think Michaela even pointed that out last night, and I agree. It, it feels like watching a student movie. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it felt like to me. I was like, yeah. I mean, I kind of, I like admire the like amateur nature around this film, but yeah, it yeah. definitely like the effects look really good, but like the quality of like the cinematography feels very dated. Yeah, for sure. Peter Jackson was doing his own cinematography using a old sixteen millimeter. Um, so most of this movie was shot without sound, which I know you is shocking say. to you. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
just like the Italians do. You're gonna you're gonna do a low right. budget movie, just do it, dub it all in later. Yeah. But it was funny because late, later on, when the New Zealand Film Commission gave them more money, they got a better camera that had sound qualities, and none of them really knew how to use it. So really? they still ended up just doing the same technique later. Well, it's uh, I mean, it's funny to describe the uh, so there's a lot of. There's a lot of handheld camera work. So this takes you back. Okay. So to me, uh, this is like, this is kind of, um, I, I think I've told you guys before, I always like kind of disparage nineties era movies, you know, the slick Hollywood stuff where it just kind of like, I don't know, as watching those, I kind of started to, you know, run out of interest in those. And my attention in the, in this time period turned toward guys like, uh, Peter Jackson, and Sam Raimi and uh, Guillermo del Toro or Larry Fessenden are these like really low budget indie movie guys who were kind of doing these scrappy do it yourself kind of uh, projects where it was, it's still before the um, dawn of like the video era. So not everybody can make a movie at this point, right? You still have to know how mm-hmm. to operate the equipment and know somewhere yeah. where you can get the, the film developed, you know, so there is a certain level of professionalism that is required before you can even get it, you know, at, at entry level. But mm-hmm. uh, the the cinematography is like um, it's like he's doing, um, you know, like something Sam Raimi would do. His cameras oh, are yeah. zooming around, so it's strapped to somebody, and they're always running with a camera. Or, yeah, running up on a roof yeah. to get the uh, to get the shot instead of using <laughs> instead of having a crane. Yeah. It's just running up on some tall hill and like I can imagine him like bending over and reaching the camera out to get the shot. Yeah. Well, there was a couple shots. Yeah, pretty, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say pretty much this whole project is like a San Raimi fan project essentially because that's what inspired him to do it was he wanted to make a Sam Raimi movie. He's like if Sam Raimi can do this stuff because I mean I guess that's maybe the thing. Sam Raimi is uh, you know like a legend in the low budget film world because how old was he? 23? When he made the the original Evil Dead, I think so. something like that. And there was all these stories of how he would, you know, he didn't have a steady cam, so he basically nailed a camera to a couple boards, and a couple guys ran around with it, and you know, they did all these yeah, inventive which, tricks. Which is essentially what Peter Jackson did in this. He was using handheld, and he basically made his own steady cam mount for like fifteen bucks. So he kind of did the same thing. There- yeah, you guys ever use the uh, <laughs> the wheelchair as a dolly trick for yeah. shooting anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that yeah. one before. <laughs> I've worn a steady cam before, and I'm like, I honestly, I'd rather find some ghetto way to do it because it, it's heavy and it gets uncomfortable very quickly. You want to yeah. see uh, like the Olympics of steady cam usage? Okay, well, this movie, but there's a movie. Actually, we covered it a uh, way long time ago called The Protector. <laughs> Which does this amazing one shot like action scene. It's a Tony oh, Jaw that movie. Staircase? Yeah. That spiral yeah. staircase around that hotel where I'm like, the guy who's wearing the steady cam rig in that that's the true MVP. <laughs> yeah. Wait, it's so like, did a guy like run a, down a spiral staircase wearing a up. steady cam? He goes up. He ran. And it's it's up. a it's like oh, a gigantic <laughs> hotel, but the hotel is like on the outside, so the whole core of the building is uh is uh, hollow. You can look down to the courtyard below. And so it goes up around this thing and the guy's like running, following, you know, the action. It's all one shot. So people are going over the side and he's following that and he's running up and it's like, that guy had to be a fucking athlete to pull that off. Yeah, you're kidding. <laughs> yeah. Either that or his, he's, his back is like completely destroyed now. Oh, well, maybe It's not. probably the shape of the mount at this point like, <laughs> he's so much better because he's become one with the steady cam mount oh, when i had to wear one it was like outside in las vegas for like 12 hours and i was just like this Oof. this is hell like, this is the worst thing like i was really excited to do it and then like two hours into doing it i was like i immediately regret this yeah <laughs> See, this is the type of conversation that movies like this inspire. People who love movies, I think, kind of gravitate to these kind of movies because it's like if Peter Jackson, if you see this movie, you're like, I could probably do that. I mean, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> at least you get the idea that, you know, it's like, well, I could probably whether you're good or not at it, you know, we, we don't know. But uh, at least the, the just the it's that kind of and I guess this is where the 90s were to me. A lot of films kind of felt like. 
uh well i guess it was the 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 rise of the the new independent boom right where everybody was like i got a 16 millimeter camera i'm gonna go out and make my movies you had people making straight dramas and doing well with them but then you had uh the folks that i like doing the splatter comedies and the horror movies and stuff like that and still applying that uh aesthetic to it so uh this movie is about aliens Mostly. It is. <laughs> I would say the poster for this movie is very misleading. Yeah? How so? Yeah. Yes. Uh, because it's the alien <laughs> in the sunglasses, like, flipping you off. And that's such a small part of this movie. And you don't get it until, like, the third act. Yeah. Well, the... Uh, yeah, I thought it was going to be a whole bunch of that. Wait, was it the first time uh, for watch for you, Sean? Oh, this one, yeah, this is my first time watching it. Okay. I had seen it before. Yeah, I had seen it a lot. I think I saw it on tape probably, you know, it was like, you know, you see uh, Dead Alive and then you go, oh, I want to see what else this guy has done. And then you watch his other two movies. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and then his next movie, he kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it was, uh, I like, you know, these uh, genre filmmakers who make, you know, horror films, right, who stick with it. And that's tough to do, especially now, because everybody, you know, you have to kind of diversify your portfolio. And if you make right. a horror movie, you got to go make a superhero movie. You got to go make your... Unless you're Mike Flanagan. Right. Yeah. Okay. So he's a he's one who's sticking with it uh, right now, right. you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was like, the guy who made Dead Alive has got a new movie coming out. Awesome. What is it? Oh, Heavenly Creatures. Okay. Well, watch Heavenly Creatures. <clears throat> it's not a bad movie. That's actually a good movie, but you know, I, mean, I think still. people need to like revisit that and assess it now. That's true. I haven't seen that since that first one watch, I suppose. Yeah. Where's my revisionist think piece on heavenly creatures thing? <laughs> actually, it's not bad. It. <laughs> well, heavenly creatures kind of foreshadowed uh, Peter Jackson's The Lovely Bones, right? I mean, I could see those Jesus. two being. See, that's a, a low point for me. Yeah. I hate that yeah. movie. As in, that like, movie. Just a why, uh, why? Why did that need to be a movie? Yeah, well, why couldn't I mean, it just live as an airport book? Yeah. Well, all airport I liked, books I eventually liked the become book movies. Lots. I was excited when it was going to be a movie, but I was very disappointed. Well, this movie, uh, it uh, so it opens in uh, in the small town of what? Well, in, 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 <laughs> yeah, Kaihoro. Kaihoro. Which I believe, I like that. that's right, in my internet research, tells me that the uh, first part of it is a Maori word meaning food, and the second mm-hmm. half is a word that means hurry, so it could be fast food, so that could mean that the whole town is basically, because that's what's going on here, right? Aliens have set up uh, shop in this town, they've taken, they've killed everybody, and they're eating them for their fast food uh like business of aliens. Are I feel going? like that's kind they of an a... inaccurate description of this movie. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a, this is a movie about four friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I feel this like that implies you're going to see like a fast food restaurant operating that way, and you do not. No, it's like an interdimensional no. <laughs> fast food chain. There's a lot of hammer fights and a lot of people chasing each other on cliffs. That's ninety mm-hmm. percent of this movie. It's a lot of cliffs in this movie. So basically, we're going to tell you, listener, that the movie is, uh, at least a half of it, is this kind of outdoors, uh, four guys running around, making, learning how to make a movie movie. They are the boys. <laughs> and the second half is where all of a sudden it gets like crazy splatterific. We go inside a house, and then there's alien makeups and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Right? This is like a yeah, this the, first half, second the half. second half. The second half is where they had more money. <laughs> That's where the New Zealand government came in and said, here's a check uh-huh. to finish your movie. Okay. So yeah, the, and then there's armies in it. What? There was? A, I mean, you know, I was waiting. felt like there was. I mean, there's a, a bunch of people in a giant shootouts and shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, our central characters, as far as I can tell, there's a guy named Derek. Who's yep. played by Peter Jackson. He is. Shorn of the beard and long hair. Everyone in this movie looks like they could be Peter Jackson. Yeah, or related <laughs> somehow. That's because I mean, two of them are pre- Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson fights himself in an amazing cinematic feat. Uh, 
<laughs> because the movie was filmed many years apart. You know, the scenes were filmed years apart. He has a scene where he fights an alien that looks like Peter Jackson that we know with the yeah. beard and the hair. Uh, yep. But it's actually Peter Jackson fighting Peter Jackson through the use of doubles and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not bad. Why is he wearing a Harry Potter Gryffindor scarf? So you can tell him apart, I guess. <laughs> and the buck teeth, I guess, right? This is Derek. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Derek works for... Oh, God, I looked this up. I didn't get this from the movie. I had to actually... It's, yeah. Do you have they, it? I think, they, I think they say it at one point, but honestly, sometimes it's hard to understand these people. But they work for the Astro Investigation and Defense Service. And if you made an acronym of that, <laughs> AIDS. <laughs> See, I missed the joke during the movie. I just I didn't rewind it. I heard that. What do you say? We really need to change that. Mm-hmm. But I didn't hear what it was. So that's yeah. funny. <laughs> well, they are and as funny as AIDS can be. Yeah, you there know? you go. Yeah. Well, they're called in uh, to investigate this phenomenon because basically there's a town. There's nobody there. Right. And it's a little mm-hmm. picturesque town on the coast of uh, New Zealand, right? It's over, it's right by the ocean. And there's nobody there. So these guys come in to, because, and they're already aware at this point that there is some type of alien menace uh, that's happening, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, tell us about these aliens. What are we, what are we in for at the beginning of this movie? Denim. <laughs> Bad wigs. <laughs> <laughs> So we got a gun, bunch of guys, basically, in blue shirts. Yes. Yep. These are our aliens. They're just guys. So ba- what it reads as is that uh, and it's one of these movies. I mean, we're talking about the budget level where it's like, basically, Peter Jackson gets all of his friends together on the weekends and goes like, all right, come and be in my movie. I can't do a, a, a New Zealand accent. So uh, <laughs> well, please, please try. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> it's just kind of like, you know, hey, everybody, like, you know, when you make your zombie movie. Your backyard zombie movie. You invite all your friends to come over. That's what's going on here. Brings all his friends to uh, to perform in his movie. So they're just the blue shirts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Until the third act. Until yeah, right where we actually money. get into uh, the money, which you know, again, as Holly said, all of the visual effects or the makeup effects in this movie are done and created by Peter Jackson, uh, which is they actually look good. they do. Mm-hmm. They yeah, their 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 articulation and all over the aliens and everything. Like it's, I'm surprised. Yeah, they speak and their mouths actually match the. Uh, I assume pre-recorded dialogue or whatever. Right. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he said he was a longtime fan of Tom Savini, and that's kind of what led to the whole splattery thing. Uh, the movie is pretty gory. Uh, I mean, where are the movies that you see now? I suppose not as gory as Dead Alive, which I think tried to go like, you think bad taste was strong? We're going to (laughs) go through the roof. We got a a baby coming out of this chick. Well, and then we have a guy who is basically, what, in one of the best chat chat birth. Describe this scene to us. It happens in the the late, it happens here. Because there is a chainsaw involved, which is a prerequisite in these kind of uh, situations. Of course, I think from the ceiling, he's lost his marbles at this point, almost literally. Um, he's hanging from the ceiling with a chainsaw, and this head alien, he does it too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, the head alien, he saws to the top of his head and then proceeds to make his way through his body. Until his out head the other end. pops out the guy's ass. Yep. Yeah. I, I don't know if we're painting the picture well enough here. These aliens look like ball sacks with sunglasses on. They're big. Like, yeah. They you know what they look like? Heads and knobby knees. They remind me of the the orc from Return of the King. Oh, the, like uh-huh. the white. That. The, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're very lumpy. Uh, yeah, very. They have lumpy asses as well. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, so they're dressed in suits, like regular human suits, because they they do. This is the idea. These aliens have come to Earth to eat people, and they disguise themselves as humans, right? Mm. Uh, and the head alien does wear a, a three-piece suit. Well, actually, I mean, I suppose they all are wearing human clothes. But when they reveal themselves and they get these gigantic the heads, but also like their shoulders pop out through the sides of mm-hmm. the uh, the suit, and their ass cheeks explode <laughs> out the back. Explode yes, they have protrusions. Yeah. So they got they their do. big asses hanging out, 
shoulders hanging out. They big walk old head. like they walk like they're holding up a, a 30 pound costume. <laughs> what they walk yeah, like. Their knees, knees are like bent. constantly bent. Yeah. Yeah. And this is not uh, necessarily a bad. I mean, like we're saying, this is these are a pretty good look. And this is what you're oh, going to no, see good. on the cover art for this movie. It's uh, enjoyable. You're gonna. It's going to take you a while to get there because in the the first half of the movie, we got to deal with some intrigue as um, Derek, the character of Derek, played by Peter Jackson, and the other two guys uh, who are like from the military branch or whatever, uh, end up chasing these aliens around the town. And also they try to save a collector who is in the town to like, he's like a tax collector. So he's handing out welfare benefits or something like that. I'm not entirely Doesn't sure. He work, does he work for bread? Is that what it is? That's another acronym. What was that? Do you yeah. remember that? Oh, I do not remember. Okay. Well, we, we, we all watched this last night. And we're taking notes. <laughs> so that's no. um, what do you think but yeah, they're handing out some bread. Sort of professional podcast. Um, this so, is one of those movies, though, that like the impression it leaves on you is not necessarily the plot. Right. right. <laughs> because the plot is just a bunch of guys like, I don't even remember the plot. I'm sitting here. No. That's why you you caught me. They, I'm spinning my wheels, hoping that you'll jump in here and tell me what's happening. In. They at the press beginning the of this button movie. for the boys and these guys come in. Yeah. Okay, and then what do That's they do it. when they get there? They just uh, run like around chasing out. people. Okay, well, That's what fine. were some of the impressions that you had from the beginning of this movie? I do remember a hammer fight. Mm-hmm. A really long hammer fight. Involving how many people? I think four. Yeah. And how many four, hammers? And then it ended up being just two. Yeah. And they were hammer fighting on the edge of a cliff. There were some stunt work scenes in this portion of the movie, which I was kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I was, a, I was not comfortable with it. No. Yeah. I was, like, I was Get yeah, out hill. But this is the kind of stuff. See, again, this is the reason why you like these movies, because it's that kind of the go for broke. You know, it's like you don't have a company of an oversight company, you know, an insurance company watching you. Right. As mm-hmm. a filmmaker, you're basically like, yeah, we can go hang off that cliff over there. You know, because well, who's going to stop no, us? It's just it. us. <laughs> and so there's a chase that where like they good. fall down a, a cliff face and it, it looks very precarious. Very. <laughs> and then eventually. It goes on for a long time. The, it that's does. Get some of the best dummy falling that I've seen in a while. What happens? Uh, the Derek falls off, ends up falling off the cliff. And the dummy they threw down is kind of like. He's arched up and everything. He just spun very well falling through the he's air. A, he's almost in like a sitting position, so it looks more <laughs> like an actual person. Yeah. Right. And it's you not know? like a complete rag doll like we, we usually see. That's maybe what gives him away. Because yeah. they're, if yeah. they're a rag doll, then you, the articulation on the shoulders, the shoulders bend too far, yeah. you know. This one doesn't because it's kind of rigid and locked. <laughs> I yeah. actually did yeah. think for a moment that it was Peter Jackson tumbling for a while. Like, well, maybe he just... You know, he's done it before. He'll just tumble. But then it was like, sure. and then it tumbled right off the edge of the cliff. It was like, oh, I guess I that's that a like dummy. Mo- I think that was the most impressive, like, dummy I've seen in a movie. Yeah, it was like, pretty good. It really was. I liked the ADR, too, that was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and Derek ends up cracking his head open on the uh, rocks on the beach. This becomes yeah. another running There's joke. A- that was a pretty big splat. That was gross. Yeah. That was, yeah. Cool. was kind of actually... It was very squishy. And how they did that, the splat, because we see in... I think it's in the same shot. The dummy comes down, and then it's almost like somebody timed... I'd have to watch the shot again. But it's yeah. almost like somebody timed the splat, to, you know, blood to splatter up uh, yeah. at the time that the thing mm-hmm. landed. It was like, huh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was good. For being so cheap. Uh Derek ends up uh, with his brains hanging out the back of his head. He cracks open his skull. There's a little flap of skull that falls down. And so for the entire rest of the movie, he's always trying to pick brain matter up and shove it back in there. And then yes, uh, it's his or not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and tie his head together to keep it from falling out. He takes his belt and like tightens it around his head to keep it shut. He wears a hat for a little while. What'd you think of the sound design in this movie? Too much. Too loud. Turn it down. My God. They, they're really trying to, they're really hitting home. 
They're really going for score. it. Score. God, can you let up for like a <laughs> second, please? That's because they have no room tone. They're just like, uh, we've got to put something in here. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, Casio keyboard uh, stuff uh, mm, punctuated really by a lot of uh, awesome indie 80s heavy metal. Back in the day when that was a thing. Yep. Uh, I do like the, the idea that heavy metal actually does uh, contribute to the death of a couple of alien guys. They get into a car that's owned by the boys, our hero paramilitary group, and uh, they accidentally turn on the radio. And because they're aliens, they just can't handle the rock, <laughs> which uh, stuns them until they're able to blow the car up or something. They shoot a like a rocket launcher at it. Again, this is, uh, I guess I'm describing scenes from the, the movie that you go like, yeah, so what? They shoot a rocket. I've seen that all the time. People shoot rocket, But like these guys have no money. So the fact that they're able to pull off effects like this, and then the car explodes, and it's like, well, you can do that, too? Well, you need gasoline and some kind of, you know, something to blow it up or start it with, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the, uh, the, um, I'm trying to think, like, so Derek is running around. The other two guys are trying to follow the path of these aliens back to, uh, like whatever their headquarters or something, right? Right. There's also this collector gets abducted. They're going to eat him basically by putting him in a pot full of vegetables and all that and cook him alive. This is yeah, actually a Bugs Bunny cartoon, right? That's like a classic thing that you see in the in like Porky Pig or something. They put him in the yeah. right. Um, there's uh, I think this was mandated because the way that I heard this, I, I listened to an interview with Peter Jackson. Where he said that actor, this is the guy with the mustache, uh, was married. He like he said he was going to be in the movie, right? And he was supposed to be yeah. the lead character. But he was married to a woman who apparently at that point in time was uh, fairly devout religious and had problems mm-hmm. with him being in a, a gore comedy. So the guy said he couldn't do it anymore which basically shut the movie down as Peter Jackson said, well, I've shot so much with you, you know, what am I going to do? And so then that's why he ended up being in the movie because he had to create a new character and all this stuff. Right. And then they were shooting it for four years. So somewhere like two years later, the guy gets divorced and then he says, you know, Hey, I want to, can I come back? And so then Mm -hmm. they put him in the pot (laughs) for the end of the movie. (laughs) So that was kind of funny. (laughs) um i'm trying to remember like okay so it's all a blur this is the problem that we have with the saturday night freak show watching the movie the night before and then uh talking about it the previous night all i remember is the end at this point i can't remember blur because for like it feels like a half hour it's just them shooting people isn't like Like an hour oh the end yeah it (laughs) it really feels like it was made up as it went along I think it like, was. It actually, no, really it totally, shows it totally was there was no script for this movie it was just whatever peter jackson came up with the week before they shot over the weekend really okay. yeah for <laughs> for four years because i know years. he said that he he got to a point where he had um you know basically had an hour-long movie and then i think that's where they kicked in money uh, to for the completion of the end, and he's like, "Fuck, I got to go back, and I'm just gonna put in a bunch of a lot more gore and splatter." And so, just came up with these like uh, splatter gore scenes. Yeah, and initially the um, the plot wasn't; it didn't have anything to do with aliens. It was just this like group of psychotic cannibals. But then, when they got money to make aliens, they decided to make it aliens. <laughs> oh, really? Right, because when you yeah. get money, you put an alien. And that's right, where the, the alien that's suits and all that stuff came from. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, they end up. I at, like it better. <laughs> at some point, uh, because the you know the nefarious uh, um, um, plot of these aliens is to you know eat humans. Um, at some point, there is a really really disgusting scene uh, where one of our heroes. Uh, from the paramilitary group has to impersonate an alien and find their way into oh, this God. house. Yeah. Why don't you guys tell me? So what happens here? No, I refuse to speak about it. Okay. I, uh, and Holly's going to be sick. Here was my mistake. My mistake was I was eating tacos when I was watching this. 
That was funny. <laughs> you don't eat while you watch like this era of Peter Jackson. <laughs> I was like, period. Really hungry. I We're, was really hungry. Did you have That's why when guacamole. we went to watch, I was like, I need 15 minutes because I was eating and I wanted Holly. to finish eating before we watched this movie. Well, did, they I have, that, did they have guacamole I, on them? It did. <laughs> Well, I, had planned, I had planned on watching this with you guys, you know, previously, but then my TV broke. Um, so I was watching it today and yeah, I was hungry. So I was eating tacos and I just did. It didn't. I didn't think twice about it. So, yeah, we're in the house, this alien infested house where they're like headquarters is or whatever. And there's a scene where Peter Jackson is basically uh, Peter Jackson as one of the aliens is basically like emptied into a bowl. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> he is empty. <laughs> and it's bright green slop or vomit or whatever the hell this is. Yeah. It's, ugh. So this, yeah, it's like a big punch bowl full of projectile insides. I don't, it's, but yeah, it's, it's bright green and ever have pistachio jello. <laughs> no, this is the part where I was like, "This is far too much like the stuff for me to be on board." I, I couldn't watch it. I, I listened to it and I just couldn't look at the screen for the five minutes. <laughs> really? This was happening. I can't do it. This is the stuff <laughs> that bothers me. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm good with like the guts. I'm good with the blood. Yep. I'm good with all that. But for, vomit for when you bring that into it, it's when, that's a when whole vomit is life. going back into someone's mouth, I have a problem. The whole other level. You know that scene in the office where like. Pam's like, well, if I, I'm, you know, if you keep eating like fish, yeah, I'm gonna puke, gonna and she pukes, and it causes the puke chain. That's yeah. me. I'm, I'm that person too. I watch someone puke, I'm gonna puke too. So yeah, I was like, I can't watch this. <laughs> well, this is like, well, that, a, it's a thing yeah. that Peter Jackson has going on it, it, throughout like his early movies. There's a lot of that to do with because in like you remember like the custard scene in uh, Dead Alive. Where like mm-hmm. somebody squirted a pimple into the thing, and somebody's oh, eating. The- yeah, there's yeah, always I like think of when I think of that movie. <laughs> there's nasty, gooey eating scenes at all times and points in his yeah. films. What happens in the rest of this, though? So after Peter Jackson is emptied into the bowl, uh, the other aliens take turns drinking Ugh. from it like a no. fucking chalice Stop. in a church or something. <laughs> And obviously one of the guys is dressed up as an alien trying to infiltrate and he, unless he wants to be unmasked, has to drink from the bowl as well. (laughs) I'm watching Sean at this point, uh, almost uh, gagging as he's remembering the scene, but it finds it's a funny scene because it turns out the guy's like, Hmm, tasty. Yeah, he, He loves it. That, I think my favorite part about that is when he comes back into the kitchen, he's like, you'll never believe what I just had to do. And the other guy's like, yay, Chuck. <laughs> 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 he's just so straightforward about it. Is this the scene? This like presages the gunfight that goes on for what feels like 20 minutes. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Where I think at some point we get an alien who gets his, uh, they pull like a guy's head off and his uh, spinal column comes with it. <laughs> yep. Right, and then they're kicking the head out the window. And that, yeah, they they pull out his the rest of his spine and kick the head out the window. That was pretty good. What is it about? Okay, so here's the thing. I remember watching uh, Dead Alive. Uh, well, it was in a public place where I probably shouldn't have been. Let's just say that. And I remember <laughs> someone. Did you watch it on a plane? No. Did you put it on at the video store? I put it on at the video store. <laughs> and uh, one of the the workers at the store next door came over and saw. Uh, you saw it on the screen. It was just horrified and disgusted by the gore, right? But what is it? Why is it? Do you think that, like, okay, so when we talk about gore, gore is disgusting. I mean, you're you're ta- you're reacting to it in a way that's like, oh, this is gross, right? This is disgusting. Mm. Um, how do you or like, why is it funny in some cases? I mean, how do you how do you make gore amusing when it's like just fucking disgusting to look at? context i guess, I guess yeah it's it gotta be t- yeah it's it's all the tone of the movie yeah but it's just amazing to me that you can do it right that you can do right. something it's, that it's could like be stomach a, churning i think like a good a, example is like look at evil dead 2 and then like the evil dead remake yeah. it's like 
The Evil Dead remake is really gory, but like super serious. Evil Dead 2, I think, is probably just as gory, but it's funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really funny. Down. Yeah. You kind of can elevate gore to like its own uh, art form or something like just a a massive. And maybe, I don't know, maybe this might be a thing that only uh, people on a certain wavelength are able to appreciate. You know, I don't know, because that was my first experience with the like the I'm like, obviously, this is over the top. You know, it's not serious. Right. We're not actually looking at something where, you know. Uh, someone's being held down screaming for their life while a chainsaw is going into them or something like that, right? And we've right. got alien, their eyeballs are popping out, somebody pr- crushes their head and things explode six feet in the air and, you know, I mean, it's just, it's the over-the-topness of it. I think that kind of, you know, like to me, it reads as like, well, this is, it's harmless then. It's not an actual representation of violence, you right. know? Mm-hmm. It's just, I mean, it's like super violent. <laughs> I guess and, and gory, but not. It doesn't seem like it's that kind of. You could show your kid this movie. No, I don't know. I would go that far. Uh, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't go that far. There's something like not realistic about. I mean, it looks good, but like it's so gooey and sticky and like over the top that it kind of makes it cartoony. Yeah, because mm-hmm. that's yeah. kind of the thing is going for here, right? The idea that this is kind of like a live action uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon or something like that. I mean, it has that kind of madcap energy yeah. to it you know the wily coyote yeah and it's not taking itself seriously yeah you know because it's like it's like if we were watching like a world war ii movie and we see a scene where a guy gets his head blown off we see his brain matter like that's intense that's a serious thing but in this we're watching a guy like pick up brain matter and shove it back into his own head but yeah. that makes it funny you know because it's ridiculous yeah mm-hmm. i think peter jackson said that buster keaton was like a big influence um you know, the old, uh, so I'm assuming, you know, it's like, that's where he gets on. It feels like a Three Stooges movie at, at several points. Because there's a lot of, I mean, that's, I mean, it, it is kind of set up like with those yuck, yuck jokes or something like that, where people are almost getting poked two fingers in the eyes and, you know, mm-hmm. only the fingers go into the eyes and come out with the eyeballs and the guy's still walking around his head half falling <laughs> off and, you know, whatever. They blow up yeah. sheep in this movie. That's like one of the, probably that was the moment I think I laughed out loud. Uh, dude was trying to shoot that, like, because of course he has a box. He's being chased by aliens. Uh, opens the box. He's got a rocket launcher in there. That was wish fulfillment. I'm like, okay, you know, we're bringing a rocket launcher into this movie. And then he shot it at somebody, and it went through the front door. Like the guy stepped out of the way. <laughs> the projectile went out the back window. Or the chainsaw. Uh, it was the chainsaw profile. He oh, yeah. chainsawed his exact <laughs> profile to walk through. <laughs> And the, the <laughs> rocket went through the front door and then through his cutout outside. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just right there, the fact that he had to chainsaw <laughs> his own profile silhouette to walk through right. is, that is something that you would see in a Looney Tunes cartoon, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's a poor, unfortunate sheep out the back. <laughs> oh, yeah, the sheep. I forgot about the, the sheep. sheep. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> um, Holly, had you seen this before? I had seen it, but it had been a really long time. I didn't remember probably most of it. I remember the sheep. <laughs> I remember the brain stuff, but I didn't remember most of this movie. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. I was kind of surprised you picked this because I was like, this doesn't seem like a movie she would like. <laughs> really? I picked that yeah. alive. <laughs> right. But that has like a plot. That's true. <laughs> I Yeah. And Not forward real, momentum. Yeah, obviously we'll talk about it in wrap-ups, but that is true. <laughs> well, it's at this point in the movie where Lord Crumb, the head alien, unmasks himself. I believe they all do, and that's when we get the extended shootouts and uh, uh, the aliens all running around. But the other thing that I liked about just the hubris, right, if you're going to keep going with this you know, insane, uh, it just keeps on ramping up the house, which has been the setting for the latter half of the movie, uh, yeah. turns out that it's a spaceship, right? It's kind of like the Rocky Horror Picture Show house or something. Yeah. At some point, it starts, you know, gas starts escaping from the bottom of it, and it's going to take off. And, and, he, and he rolls up the lawn Oh yeah, beforehand, yeah. which is pretty funny. 
Because he's the only one left, I think, Lord Crumb, right? Everybody else yeah. is trying to get yeah. out of the house before it takes off. Or no, are they trying to... They, they were outside. Derek's still in the house, right? Yeah. The only two guys, the other three guys, because they actually do save mustachioed man uh, from the cannibals or from being right. eaten by mm-hmm. the uh, aliens. And yeah, he rolls up the lawn, which is awesome. Uh, you know, it sucks it back in into the house. Um, was that house a miniature? Oh, uh, you mentioned it in the chat last night. It's a large miniature from the get go. You think? I think it had so. Because there's, there's obviously there's some facade they built because you know there's people running around somewhere a little bit, or I don't know, maybe they used exteriors of a real house. And then it's, I don't, I don't know, but I know it, it's a large miniature. Yeah. Because it, there's a scene where they do actually like blow part of it up. Was that with the rocket launcher or they threw dynamite in there? I can't remember. There was a grenade. There was something. a rocket launcher. If you watch mm-hmm. that again, when he shoots the rocket launcher, it goes in such a way where you see the rocket, la- the rocket going and then it gets to the house and it just stops there. Oh, yeah. yeah. The house blows up. <laughs> so it doesn't like go in like they had on a line no, as far as it could go. It's, yeah. It's very clearly on a line. <laughs> yes. It was very funny. Are we thinking that that house was a miniature or that was an actual house? Because, I mean, again, this was the part where I was sitting there going like, this movie's got a bigger budget than I thought it did. <laughs> this is bigger, like, to pull this stuff off. You Now you got a house that you're going to blow up. I think that was a miniature. Okay. Yeah, no, I think. They, I, yeah. No, I think Sean's right. The facade, like there were parts that were in an actual house, obviously, because they filmed, you know, with people outside. But the the explosion, that was a miniature. And then the house actually lifting off into space is also a miniature. Uh, mm-hmm. but, uh, no, that was real. Uh, IMDb said so. <laughs> oh, okay. So that was the actual space house? Yeah, that was the actual space house. Yeah. It's pretty convincing, you know. I mean, again, you know, if yeah, we're... It's not bad. To be able to detect talent in a first movie, it's like, okay, well, I mean, that was, uh, you know, with the, the, the dummy drop and the house taken off, I'm like, all right, that was, you know, convincing enough. You sold me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Derek st- stows away on board the thing, and uh, so he's the only person who can actually uh, kill the aliens. You know, I was surprised that there wasn't like, uh, so I suppose they just ate everybody. They weren't like, there's no humans in cold storage. That's what I'm saying. Like the whole, like for their fast food restaurant like premise of this movie like isn't really shown so maybe it's not a restaurant maybe they just maybe earth is the restaurant they just come to like get their fill and then uh head back But every plot synopsis you read of this movie says that and that's not Mm -hmm. in this movie yeah Yeah, there's only that little bit of lord crumb talking about the what is it called the the, his international inter uh inter galaxy chain of restaurants that humans are used for yeah but that's but the I, part I, I hear it in. I wonder if it's like, I wonder if it's like a, a like a sampling situation where they like work for the fast food chain and they're just like testing the product to see if they mm. want to buy it. You know what I mean? So they're checking out this little New Zealand town. They're sampling the the life, and seeing funny. if they like it. I you know what I mean? Like, different depending the description is still from. misleading. <laughs> oh, I agree. I totally it, agree. I mean, like when I hear that, I'm thinking I'm going to see these people working at like a galactic McDonald's, right? And, <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's not in this movie. No. no, it's not. You think New Yorkers taste different than Chicagoans? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's based on the oh, amount boy. of pizza that they eat. Chicago pizza <laughs> or the New York pizza. Probably. I mean, if we're going by like veal rules here, like people in New York are definitely going to have like the most tender muscles and stuff because they're all crammed in so close. Sure. <laughs> yeah, everyone in LA is going to be all like, well, let's go running. So they're going to be all gamey. And... I was like, LA is like the grass fed free range, right? Well, that's, yeah, it's yeah. very true. Yeah, they're all. And New York is like, well, look, we have your veal penned up so it hasn't been able to move. So it's nice and tender. <laughs> The uh, the climactic moment of this movie then gives us uh, Derek, who our hero, our director, star, writer, producer, cinematographer, makeup effects man, Peter Jackson, threatening that he's coming to get you, alien bastards, on an uh, intergalactic phone call yeah. as he sits in the pilot's chair, now adorned in the skin of lord crumb this is the guy that he uh he bore through and was birthed yeah. from yeah he's been reborn up, yeah <laughs> didn't he say I'm i've been born again. again uh yeah. setting up bad taste too which unfortunately where he goes to the home planet 
Yeah, yeah right? Where he I starts eating aliens. Movie now. <laughs> I heard, the last I heard was that he was working on, like, doing some kind of remaster of it. Maybe it's out already. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that was during... Uh, um press for what is they shall not grow young what's the uh the latest movie peter jackson did have you heard about this um Kate yeah Smith? it's something like that or they shall not go they shall not grow old sorry uh yeah. he took footage of soldiers from world war one colorized it uh and then used lip readers so you can actually tell what they're saying, like, you know, high definition, yeah. the shit out of this stuff. So it looks contemporary, right? The idea being that, you, you know, you, you always have a distance from World War I uh, footage because it looks so old. But if we clean right. it up and it looks like, you know, something shot today, it's going to bring this immediacy to the plight of, uh, you know, all these uh, men who served in uh, in the Great War. And I think it reads, Sounds really uplifting. I think that's his last movie, right? Or, I mean, his yeah. last major film was uh, The Mortal Engines. He produced that one, right? I think he directed. I think that's a writer-director. I think that's Peter Jack from the director of The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, comes The Mortal Engines. We can't wait. Honestly, just reading the plot synopsis of that movie sounded so stupid. I can't imagine. Like, I kind of am intrigued by how stupid the plot is to watch it. This is the one I where the city is. Oh, you did it, see it, and I have no idea what I watched. I don't remember anything. I didn't. I I didn't understand it. I didn't retain anything. Totally forgettable. He was just a producer, Colin. On Mortal uh, Engines. Mortal Engines. Oh really? Yeah. So what was his last film? They shall the not Hobbit. grow old. Uh, yeah, the the Hobbit, and then they shall not grow old documentary, and then he's got a Beatles documentary coming out. And looks like there's stop with the Beatles content. My it looks God. like there's a there was Beatles Adventures content of in this movie. Sequel. Yeah, there was. Oh, that's right. They're like driving Adventures with these. of Tintin sequel in the prog- in progress too. Oh, for you got to give can that. We, up. Can we bring that to the podcast just so we can come full circle? Yeah. Uh, they basically they drive around with uh, cutouts of the Beatles, uh, so they look like they're driving the cars in uh, in bad taste, which is kind yeah. of funny. <laughs> For a while, which I'm like, where do they yeah. sit? Where are they driving? They're like in the back sure seat, driving with these guys up in the they're front like seat. Standing. Yeah, they are kind of standing. It's like they're the like back standing. Thing it's the, weird. Has the steering wheel. Yeah. It is funny when the blood like splashes on Ringo's face or something happens like that. Mm-hmm. It's good for a joke or two. He looks surprised. Yeah. But I guess what I was going there was just like, where has the career of Peter Jackson gone? I mean, was uh. Because, I mean, you come off of these titanically huge movies, Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, you go from little movies, bad taste gets you a little bit more money, uh, proves that you can be a filmmaker. You get Dead Alive. That one was the one that kind of made the the hit, the festival circuit. Heavenly Creatures says you can do drama. Then you do the Frighteners. You can handle, you know, we created Weta Workshop, and you can do all these visual effects that rival, you know, ILM and all this other stuff. And then you get awarded your dream project, Lord of the Rings, which is like crazy unheard of, right? It gets to do three huge movies in his own home country, um, pretty much under his own control. Those get nominated for Academy Awards, uh, you know, and then he gets to do his other dream project, King Kong. And then he did The Lovely Bones is like, I'm going to segue back to like dramas and stuff that doesn't do so well. Comes back with The Hobbit and then. That was years ago. It feels like, like where has the man gone or, uh, is it just, you know, I think he's taking a break after those. He's taking this, this Sam Raimi career path. I'm going to make unrecognizable fantasy movies now. And then I'll come back and direct a Marvel film. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, is that where you get kind of cornered the whole idea? Like once you direct these movies that are huge, huge budget productions that you can't, come back and do something on a smaller scale i mean sam raimi did right he came back and did uh drag me to hell went back to his roots you know before he does the new doctor strange movie or whatever he's got in the pipeline now but yeah he still did three spider-mans and oz great and powerful Mm -hmm. it's a lot of studio garbage yeah well who knows i mean when you have that kind of fuck you money you like who cares (laughs) yeah Maybe that's it. Maybe. Well, I know that Peter Jackson's restoring old planes. He's got his production company. It's called Wingnut Films. 
And so he's got Wingnut Wings, which uh, also sells replica models that you can uh, pick up and purchase yourself. Uh, so he does that. He's been knighted by... Wingnut Wings uh, is my favorite restaurant. Wingnut Wings. He's been knighted? Yeah. Yeah, he's a knight. Yeah. I thought that was reserved for, like, English people only. I've oh. researched this. Other people can get it. There's there's not... Could he be part of the Commonwealth? I think so. If he's part of the Commonwealth in order to be knighted, but you get honorary other shit if you're just, you know, American and all that. And so he is Sir Peter Jackson to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't let anybody be a knight, it seems like. Except me, damn yeah. it. All I want to do is... Yeah, okay. Uh, so I tell you what, uh, listener, we're going to tell you whether or not you should check out this movie we're speaking of, which is called Bad Taste. But first, we're going to read some of your mail. And to do that, we're going to need the assistance of our mailman. And his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, right, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. I feel like he could be related to those aliens, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. He's just it as does. disgusting. So His butt hangs out like theirs. <laughs> Ew, Igor butt. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we want to let you know how you can join the Freak Show family. Uh, we'll read your comments on the air. All you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Sat Freak Show. On Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, Andrew Bradford writes in, and he uh, uh, tells us a short story on how he came to find our podcast. He says, roughly a year ago, my family relocated to the Netherlands, moving from Colorado, and just a few weeks into our first month, it was Easter, and it's part of our tradition. We watch Night of the Lepus. Well, there was a slight problem as our furniture, much of our clothes, electronics, and DVDs were on a cargo ship, so we had no way to watch the movie. I was a little bummed, but not to be deterred. On Monday, before I went to the gym, I searched for Night of the Lepus on my podcast app, and lo and behold, I found your podcast, listened to the episode, and it's been a steady stream of your episodes ever since. Aw, that's nice. awesome. Better. I like that as an Easter tradition. That's right. Yeah, I'm going to start so that cool. as an I bought that damn movie. I should watch it every Easter. It is a movie. If you haven't seen Night of the Lepus with DeForest Kelly from Star yep. Trek, Bones from Star Trek, and Janet Lee and several other folks, uh, yep. Rory Calhoun, I think, is in that one, and so. Giant Killer Bunny Rabbits. Yep. Tech, small, southwestern town fantastic okay so about uh bad taste adam kaler writes in and says wow this is a true cult classic early peter jackson movies such as meet the feebles bad taste and dead alive make me feel like a kid again watching a movie i shouldn't be watching love it or hate it it really shows what someone who is passionate about their craft can do with limited resources perseverance and a warped sense of humor that was a compliment yeah that's true for sure Nelson Nascimento says Peter Jackson is a one-man show. He directs, writes, produces, edits, photographs, acts, and does the effects, etc. Uh, one, uh, 101 on independent filmmaking. Oh, and the aliens harvesting humans for fast food as well. So they say. <laughs> Ryan Handsome Jansen says, oh yeah, I love this film. It's such a fun debut. And then he quotes, I'm Derek. I'm a Derek, and Derek's don't run. That was Derek's <laughs> funny line. Yeah. I didn't uh, know this rule about Derek. <laughs> a Derek doesn't <laughs> run. Uh, Peter Gatt says he's not a fan of early Peter Jackson movies, and he's only loved two of his films. But I'll let you decide which ones. And then later on a different post, he wrote, "You should pick a Peter, a better Peter Jackson film like Heavenly Creatures, for example." Uh... Like you said, I think maybe as as a society, we're due for a revisit on Heavenly Creatures. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, the Lovely Bones as your other one, Peter. I guess that's (laughs) oh Uh, no. Jason (laughs) Fenton writes in and says that poor seagull. What happened to the seagull? I can't remember the seagull. Uh, Oh, he landed on it. He landed on it. Yeah, that's right. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what exploded. That's where the blood came from. He landed on a <laughs> oh, seagull. When he fell, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got you. Last week we watched a movie called The Relic. 
Brent Zemecki writes in and says it's a fun movie, but a better book series. That was the book series about Aloysius Pendergrass. Someone's always read the book. And how many of those were there? I can't remember. We said just there's two. like six or something. There's just, no, there's two relics, it. but Aloysius two relics, but Pendergrass is in a bunch of... Right. He's a, he's a character that shows up in a bunch of other books. Uh, G-Money writes in and says, uh, Tom Sizemore looks way more coked up than the relic after a helping of hypothalamus. He says he saw this at the Chinese theater way before I could buy tickets to R-rated movies. I love the monster design and how he shreds the special forces. No! <laughs> a classic, classic moment. Uh, Cinegeri says, I discovered this movie fairly recently and I was surprised as the monster takes time to be shown. Music, cinematography, acting, and the creature were well done for a movie of this kind. My only complaints are the final CG creature doesn't look good and the movie is dark. Very dark. Uh, it's very dark. Uh, but Colin loves it so much, dark he's, is an he's, understatement. Living, he's living in that <laughs> You know, right now, right now. Uh, in the dank dark, what's a dank dark basement? I mean, well, that's very um, true. That's true. That's uh, true. Previous week, we watched a movie called Tourist Trap. Uh, Sean Roger writes in and says David Schmoller, the director, directed a cool little horror movie in 1986 called Crawl Space, starring renowned psychopath Klaus Kinski. There's a great short film documentary in which Schmoller describes his experience of working with Kinski. It's called, like, uh, Please Kill Mr. Kinski or something like that. <laughs> uh, I had you, a good time. You guys know Klaus Kinski? Familiar nope. with? Uh, the name sounds very familiar. I'm sure we've talked about it before. He's a um, uh, infamous German actor uh, who was in a bunch of uh, Werner Herzog's movies, Fitzcarraldo, right? Uh, you know, uh, he was in Nosferatu the Vampire. And apparently... Uh, just you know, it was one of those guys who, on a movie set, just did whatever the hell he, he wanted and wouldn't do what a director, uh, you know, because he was an actor. Uh, Maya Madsen says because uh, we had asked should Tourist Trap be remade, and she says, uh, well, it kind of was minus the funhouse serial killing in a movie called Love Object. Um, oh, crap, the guy who's in that. That's um, who's the guy in the Wrong <laughs> Turn? Uh, well, anyway, he's in. Oh, it. Uh, Desmond Harrington. Yeah, there yes. you go. Because all it was in my head was De uh, Devin Sawa, and I'm like, no, that's not it. Okay, Desmond Harrington's <laughs> in this called movie Holly. called Love Object. Uh, okay, so let me let me start this over. Again. <laughs> she says the movie was kind of remade, minus the Funhouse serial killing in Love Object. Okay, on second thought, it's not at all the same, except in one important aspect, the most important aspect. See, she's going to the whole idea. We were saying that the guy was making dummies, and because it was a PG movie, it was implied that there was a sexual thing going on, right? He he made a dummy right. of his wife. Uh, in Love Object, it is about a guy who has a relationship with a uh, sex doll. Uh, but anyway, Maya says, when I hear uh, Tanya Roberts, I think Beastmaster. Have you guys done that yet? We have Stay not. Tuned. Yeah, we have not, and I think we forgot to mention when we were talking about what Tanya Roberts had done, uh, we forgot to mention Beastmaster, which I'm sure is what everybody was like, you know, we we're like, that 70s show, or View to a Kill. We're like, <laughs> Beastmaster, for God's sakes, it was on USA, like, all the time, or HBO. Uh, Jacob Laws writes in, says, Tanya Roberts was also in the so bad but entertaining of View to a Kill as probably the second worst Bond girl after Denise Richards, and probably the most annoying. That would be as bad. Oh, man. I like parts of the video kill. Uh, so, that brings us to the most exciting portion of the evening. And we're going to tell you what we thought of tonight's movie, Bad Taste. We're going to go around the room. We're going to start with Colin. Colin, what did you think of tonight's movie, Bad Taste? Um, I'm of two minds about the movie. Um, and now you know, I suppose this were is the, they, was your mind split in half via chainsaw. Yeah, that happens. You know, you get the inside look at like a guy's head as it flops open as a chainsaw goes through. Um, I was not terribly entertained by the movie the first time I watched it or, you know, because I had seen dead alive first. It's one of those things where you kind of, you see the better one and then you go back and see the one that led up to it. Yeah. Um, and so this time it was also, I had that same kind of sensation where I'm just like, this movie is not really going anywhere. It does kind of feel like 
It's just made up as it goes along, and it doesn't really know where it's going. A lot of these guys just running around and doing goofy stuff, and how goofy it is depends on, I guess, you, you know, uh, and, you know, whether that appeals to you or it hits with you or whatever. Um, it didn't really land with me. But, right, once the uh, the splattery gore stuff kicks in, and here's the other thing, too, that I was thinking about, like, well, you know, we were watching it last night. Um, you know, we're talking about the cinematography, and it kind of does feel loose, you know. It doesn't feel like a, a modern film where it's all post-David Fincher. All camera movements have to be yeah. motivated by, you know, right? He kind of gave us the lockdown uh, thing, or they have handheld and moving cameras, you know, like in, in TV show coverage that just move to move. This is feels very handheld and uh, handheld now to me almost reads as amateur. But at the time, I think you were seeing it a lot in, uh, documentary kind of like the cops TV show was all over the fucking place at this era. And so you read that as, uh, you know, this is documentarian or real life or whatever. And a lot of these nineties movies kind of adopt that. But what I was thinking about the, the cinematography was, um, all of those shots were planned out, even though it looks kind of haphazard. It's like, there is a definite plan to when we're going to, cut from this action to this action to sell the gag and then that's going to tumble off into this action because you got to think this guy's got one camera it's not a thing that's been covered from three different angles and he's just cutting between the best one he had to plan out every how he was going to solve the gag you know uh and shoot it with the that exact uh cover it or you know whatever those exact shots so it is um there's a film had to plan more for this than lord of the rings (laughs) <laughs> right yeah once you, yeah because then you just have well, we're just gonna run cameras all over the place um yeah. so i think yeah it does show uh there's obviously a filmmaker's brain at work here uh i mean this is a do-it-yourself kind of thing i think there's like three people in the credits at the end and he thinks his mom and dad who helped you know <laughs> it really does feel like this guy just went off and made this movie and it does uh become entertaining the more the longer it goes along it just takes a while to uh to ramp up and again i think uh um dead alive is a much better uh accomplishment at it and this one i think you know he's kind of embarrassed of i think in some of the interviews that he's done um you know but so i don't know would i recommend it to you i think i would listener i think i do recommend it just for the you know if you're interested in uh do-it-yourself filmmaking Right. I forgot to mention uh, Robert Rodriguez was also around this point in time. So you had uh, El Mariachi. And I mean, that's the groundswell. What, what was happening in the late 80s, early 90s in, in do it yourself filmmaking. And I think this is one of, uh, oh, there's one I got to, no one's seen this movie. It's called Leaf Jonker's Darkness. It's a vampire movie that was shot on 8 millimeter. And it's a It does not thing. sound like a real movie. Oh, yeah. No. I, uh, <laughs> You're a liar. Yeah, lying liar who lies. If someone has seen this and is hearing this part of the show, you got to tell me if you've actually seen the movie. But, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think if you're interested in, 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 I think that's more of the appeal of this movie, right? Is the do it yourself angle and how they pulled off all this stuff and the kind of the, 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 the slapstick splatter. Uh, but if you're into that kind of thing, I think you'll like it. So you should check it out. That's my review. Uh, Sean, what do you think of Bad Taste? Um, I think you're right. I think that you can see the uh, the filmmaker spirit um, throughout this entire movie. I was shocked to learn that um, they did this over four years. Um, I was very surprised by that. Just the commitment there, the time commitment, and to actually get it done and finish it. Um, I know plenty of people who have uh, who have quit projects. And they just have languished and, you know, they still sit there unfinished today. So I appreciate that. Um, the other things uh, that I liked about this movie um, don't take that. Um, is, um, I mean, practical effects. Like, and the fact that, it, you know, they're doing this all themselves. Some of the stuff they pulled off in this is amazing. And, um, you know, it's, it's artwork unto itself. Um, I had the movie playing in the background while we were... Um, uh, doing the podcast and just seeing some of the stuff that they pulled off is, uh, is fantastic. Um, it is, it's also a lot funnier than I thought it was going to be. I had no idea what this movie is. I, well, a little bit of idea since we saw dead alive. Um, 
but I didn't think it was going to be this funny. I laughed a lot during it. Um, pretty humorous. Um, uh, the only bad thing about this, we could cut 20 minutes out of this movie. Like somebody mentioned earlier that it had about an hour long movie before the funding stepped in. Um, I wish the funding had stepped in, but they kept the uh, an hour, maybe hour 10 or something like that. Cause it just, the gunfight goes on for way too long as far as I'm concerned. Um, but everything else is pretty like pretty fun. Um, I enjoyed watching it. Um, I think it's uh, uh, maybe fast forward through a couple of gunfights there, but other than that, like it's a good time. Like you know, the effects, um, it's funny. Um, it goes in places I never thought it was going to go. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was uh, pleasantly surprised by bad taste. Um, cut about twenty minutes out, and I think you got a really good movie there. Um, but I'll recommend bad taste. I had a good time watching it. Michaela, that's who you are. Uh, I so I'd seen this movie before, and the first time I saw it, I was kind of disappointed because, in my opinion, the poster, the synopsis, all pretty misleading for what this movie actually is. I think there are some fun moments, and it has really good special effects, and I really admire the way it was made and the craft put into it and the love put into it. But I feel like you can get all those same qualities from Dead Alive, and I feel like you should just watch Dead Alive instead. So I cannot recommend this. Just go watch Dead Alive. It's more polished, more fun, just as gory, moves at a better clip, actually has a plot you can follow, delivers on what it promises. Go watch Dead Alive instead. You don't need to watch this. Holly? Yeah, I think um, I think you're all spot on um, with your opinions about it. I, I think... Um, I think it's it really impressive to watch Bad Taste and then watch Dead Alive and see how far Peter Jackson has come as a as a filmmaker. Um, I think there's like you know you watch you watch a lot of a lot of filmmakers throughout their career and you see you see progress and everything, but I feel like that that is a whole new level to watch to watch bad taste and watch dead alive and see how much he's grown in that just a few years i think there's something there's really impressive watching the two um watching the the uh transition between the two um so as far as like watching it as a study in film i think you know colin and sean and michael you've all uh, hit on that it's it's kind of it's a staple. You're you know you're seeing what amateur filmmaking really is at at its height and um, what someone can do when they're passionate about something and put their money into it and put their time into it. You know, over four years just filming on weekends. You know, the alien masks he baked those in his mom's oven. Like it's just it's impressive. It's really impressive. So for those reasons alone, just seeing quality time and effort put into a film like that i i think it's worth watching for that and then on top of that you get some really amazing special effects i think that alone is worth watching it for um i agree with michaela like it's it's not as good as dead alive at all um i love dead alive it's one of my favorites i could watch it all the time um but this one has a really slow burn from the first act to the second and it's it, uh, uh, Sean, you're right. There's so much you can cut out of it. Um, absolutely. So it, there, there is a lot to get through before you get to the action, before you get to most of the gore and most of the entertaining points of the movie. I was about to say plot points, but there really aren't any. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would. So for those reasons, I would definitely recommend it. I think it's a staple in in just a study of film, really, especially you know splatter movies gore horror I, I think it's a staple and especially if you're a fan of peter jackson to see where he started um i think all those reasons are are good enough to to spend time and, and watch bad taste it's it's got some good things that i think you can get out of it so i recommend bad taste all right so that's the final word then on bad taste uh <laughs> next week we're gonna watch a movie that's chosen by michaela Kayla, what will we be watching next week? Well, it's a oh. summer is around the corner, oh, no. and I usually do a thing for the summer. So, oh and boy, so, <laughs> and uh, summer of canon, we've exhausted those options. Um, Wait, we still haven't animal, done Invasion attack, USA. Summer. We did good. <laughs> Sorry, what's that, Colin? We still haven't done Invasion USA. <laughs> oh, that's, oh that, you, Colin, you know what? You can bring that. Yeah. In. I'm not bringing that. <laughs> 
That's I, I Chuck Norris movies are not what anyone thinks they are. That's true. <laughs> that's that is true. Um, Looking at you, so, Dolphin. Since we are all, you know, we're not really going to get our blockbuster summer that we usually get. We're going to have our own freak show version of a oh blockbuster summer. And we're going to go through a couple of movies that were really teed up to be like big, successful blockbusters and really drop the ball for some reason. And next week, we're going to start with 2019's Serenity. Ooh. Oh, now I know you know the twist and I know it, too. All right. But we need to make sure they don't find out what the twist is. So, yeah, I don't know, what, you know what the twist is. This movie, please keep it to yourself. Colin, okay. do you know? I don't even know what this movie is. I'm it's thinking Matthew of a, McConaughey, a, Anne Hathaway, Jason Clark, Diane Lane, Juman Hansu. No one saw it. I can't wait to watch this. All right. I, I know, know the other too. Serenity. It's on Amazon Prime. If any, for people watching along, it's. Um, we'll get into it next week, but yeah, 2019 <laughs> Serenity. I'm excited. <laughs> don't Google it. No, so don't look up time. anything about look, this movie. I won't look at anything. I won't. Nothing, Colin. Don't do it. Well, Colin, I have I will to send I, you the social. Yeah, media I guess so. Too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, next week, Serenity on the Saturday Night Freak Show. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.